This is, this is a sprint seminar. It has to do with literally where, where has all the nitrogen gone. The motivation for this talk is that um, it's become clear and clear to me that we have done a great job in knowing where, where things like nitrogen come from, but that we're a little bit weaker on the idea of where the heck does this stuff go. And the reason that's important is that if it doesn't go away, it could be back to bite us. In other words, induce time delays and lags that might be serious in restoration. So we need to know about this. So um, that is one of the reasons um, why I decided to give this little talk about um, nitrogen. We've done some research. We've coupled with the monitoring people, um, with the USGS, with the modelers, um, to try to try to investigate this question. And one of the things we found is, um, I think there are some real hot spots in the seascape and the landscape that remove nitrogen. I want to tell you a story about that. I also want to leave a few take-home messages. And because this is such a short seminar, I'm not reading any of these graphics. Um, you read them. Um, so let's talk a little bit about what we know about nitrogen loads in the bay. This is from the Patuxent River. Three time periods. Covers 360 years. And the take home message here is that um, it took about 350 years to double the nitrogen load in the Patuxent. And then in the last 50 years, we think we've doubled it again. So um, the, the number I carry around in my head for pristine bay, current bay, is enriched by about a factor of six to eight. Um, there's a neat story behind how we got the John Smith stuff, but I can't tell you that story right now. So, big load increases. Um, there are also some long records around here of loads. This is from Norb Jaworski. Um, uh, about a hundred year record of load from various sources uh, to the head of the uh, Potomac River estuary. Um, one of the points I make here is that um, uh, climate makes a difference. Um, this is the East Coast drought of the 1960s. Um, that tells us one thing right away, and that is climate variability is pretty important. Never mind climate change. Climate variability is real important. We struggle with that all the time. The second thing it tells us is that the few sources here are doggone important. Um, after all, we don't go through toilet flushing droughts. I mean, we all flush whether it's raining or not. However, the landscape doesn't release things if it doesn't rain so much. So, interesting point there. And then the Bay Program. Um, one of the gripes I've had with the Bay Program, there's nobody here from the Bay Program, is there? <laughs> is that, is that, <laughs> I'm an academic, I can say anything, right? Okay, um, is that the world was created sometime in August of 1984, and we have progressed forward since then. You Darwin fit in there somewhere and so forth and so on. Um, but that's when the world was created, August 1984. That's not actually the case. Um, and we can learn something from uh, the earlier history of the Bay, and I've just showed you a couple of those. And in fact, one thing that I'm pretty impressed with, um, our friends at the USGS put together this. So not only do we have um, some really fine records now over long periods of time of places where nutrients come from, like the fall lines, but also spread out across the landscape. So we see here the flip side of what my talk is about. These are the hot spots for nutrient sources. And we need to ask the question, where are the hot spots for where this stuff goes? And that's what I'm going to tell you about. So this is a bit of a story. It takes place in the Patuxent River estuary and primarily in the upper part of the Patuxent River estuary, which I'll show you a little bit about so that you'll feel like you've lived there all your life. Um, so the upper Patuxent has got lots of tributaries, like many of our systems. Uh, they tend to, it's, it's a narrow sort of little river. It's flashy. When it rains, the flow goes up right away. Um, uh, in the more developed streams, there is more discharge. The peaks are higher, the valleys are lower, and the more forested ones, the peaks are lower, the valleys are higher. So we can see the human signature even in the hydrology very rapidly. Um, it also serves as a water supply, and it is, uh, as, as is true now of much of that basin, it's developing rapidly. The middle Patuxent, shown in the yellow here, uh, covers uh, about a little more than a third of the basin. Um, and when we get down to the estuary, it's tidal. Uh, it has more marsh area than open area. And as I'm about to tell you, it's a key element in the nutrient economy of this whole ecosystem. 
Um, the tidal marshes in the Patuxent, and this is interesting, are, they are very productive and they're keeping pace with sea level rise. Uh, um, almost 70% of the marshes in the Chesapeake are, are erosional. These are not. They have maintained about the same acreage and about the same configuration at least since 1917. Um, and it's probable that they were building prior to that. So they haven't been eroding. Um, whenever I go into these marshes, which I try to avoid almost at all costs, um, I'm reminded of Humphrey Bogart and Catherine Hepburn and, and, the, and the African Queen, you know. I'm always looking around the boat to see if there are any gin bottles around, you know, or whether somebody's heaved those over the side. It is, the point is, they are, you can almost feel the photosynthesis. I mean, they are, it's a huge photosynthetic factory. Uh, and it comes in all kinds of forms. Okay, this is where monitoring and science collide in a productive way. And so this is an important little slide. Some folks at uh, Jug Bay started measuring nitrate concentrations on the inflowing tide, water flowing into the tidal marshes, and then they measured nitrate when the water was flowing out of the tidal marshes. And you can see here that there were jugunda differences. We're talking 200 micromolar nitrate going into these marshes, and we're talking 20 molar nitrate. Come, that's a factor of 10. I mean, that is a huge difference. All of this apparently occurring in something like six, seven, eight hours. So, I mean, this is enough to get your attention. And, you know, as a science guy, you know, we all said, well, wow, huh, what's causing that? And so people came up with all kinds of hypotheses, none of which seemed to um, be very quantitative. They all seemed to have things wrong with them. So what we did was we reverted to one of the things that people in many branches of science, including ecologists, uh, uh, resort to, and that is a mass balance, a budget. Um, it's one of the things we believe in. And what this really means is, in a budget, you need to know the inputs, the outputs, and the changes in storage. If you understand a system that is at roughly its steady state, they need to balance. So it is a way to hold our feet, as uncomfortable as that is, hold our feet to the fire relative to understanding. So in this little budget that we produce to try to understand the role of these marshes as potential hot spots in, in the uh, landscape, we put together a budget. So what we did was we needed to measure those black arrows coming out from the uh, pinkish circles, the monitoring program, the USGS, MDE, they measure those things. We needed to also measure the black arrows coming out the bottom of the box. And monitoring programs typically do not measure rate processes. So we went out and measured the Bs, that's long-term burial, the Ds, that's denitrification, and the T, the transport, that is, the movement of materials from the upper estuary into the lower estuary, okay? So we needed to get those measured to see if we could balance this budget. And that doesn't mean we understand the system, but it tends to move us in that direction. If a budget is wildly out of balance, you know one thing, something's missing. There are bad measurements in here. Conceptually, you're missing something. So we started putting it together. Denitrification was very important. Just a little quick tutorial here. Um, denitrification is a real end source for nitrogen. It transforms nitrate, NO3, into N2 gas. Nitrate, plants love it. N2 gas is basically biologically inert, so it is a real loss term. And this is the reaction sequence that has to occur for denitrification. So we went out all over these marshes and the creeks, collected sediment cores, used the technique to measure denitrification, did that for a year uh, in the tidal fresh and the oligohaline marshes. We also took these cores in areas represented by high marsh, low marsh, um, creekside marsh, so that we, and we took the number of cores in proportion to the area that those habitats represented. And then we took cores in the sediment um, and used what's called the um, uh, lead 210 technique to, to estimate accretion rates. Then we looked at the concentrations of nitrogen and phosphorus and so forth down in the core. And from that we could estimate what we call a long-term burial rate. This is the stuff that is uh, on its way to being coal. In other words, it's not 
the labile bits of organic matter that are going to get recycled. These are the pieces of organic matter containing nitrogen and phosphorus that really do get buried in the accreting sediment column. So here's the story, um, and we're getting close to the end. Um, does it balance? So watch the um, little question marks. Um, about 50, uh, 5,400 5, kilograms per day get into the Patuxent River estuary. Our estimates indicated about 1,100 get denitrified in the marsh and in the creeks. About 1,400 get buried. So in these accreting marshes, burial is really important. About 3,000 gets exported. And the amount we couldn't account for is 46. So we think we got a balanced budget here. Uh, these are decade averaged inputs. So we're favoring neither wet nor dry years. Now, this doesn't prove we absolutely know what's going on here, but it certainly helps us in that direction. And when we summarize all this, we've got this 5,400 kilograms per day coming in from all the sources, surge treatment plants, diffuse loads, atmospheric deposition. About 28 goes down the estuary. 26 is lost. And here's the key point. In this Marsh Creek complex represents 2% of the landscape above Benedict, Maryland, above upstream of the mesohaline estuary. 2% of the whole system, it, only, it represents about 1.3% of the total area. It removes 48% of all the nitrogen that gets in here. That is called a hot spot. So we ought to think about not paving these marshes. To put this in another context, the sorry, there, are, there are nine or 10 storage treatment plants on the Patuxent that discharge more than a million gallons per day. All of them have um, nitrogen uh, removal capabilities. Um, they remove about 0.8 million kilograms of nitrogen per year. The marshes remove about 0.9 mil, uh, million kilograms per year. So we're, we're at about the same, or, well, certainly within the same order of magnitude, one of which we have to pay for, the other of which we don't, but it does take up space. Okay, 2% of the basin above there is salt marshes. Now, nitrogen removal is not the only benefit, but um, it is a big number. Um, let's look at some restoration activities. And before doing that, here's a scary graph. This one scares me. Population in the basin is going up, but the amount of impervious service is going up even faster. What we really need to see is, is you know, population perhaps leveling and impervious service diving. That's not the case. Um, so we see a lot of this kind of stuff, which doesn't help anything. So now I'm almost at the end, and I think I've got a minute to go. Um, so what do we do about this? How do we, how do we deal with this? And uh, Grace Brush wrote an interesting essay a couple years ago. Um, uh, she's a paleoecologist, and she said the following things in this es essay. Um, that's, that's a beaver, by the way. Um, uh, that the pre-colonial landscape was covered with forest and many wetlands. Pollen grain analysis indicated there were micro swamps everywhere. Okay? Um, over the past 300 years, particularly the last 50, we've done away with a lot of that and increase the loads. Um, and there is, in her mind, a net loss in the denitrifying capability of the landscape. And it appears to her that beavers were the key engineers in this. And so I got busy on this. And likely in the Chesapeake Basin, there were five million beavers running around, gnawing on things, when, uh, G when John Smith sewed up. Um, by the time the human population got to five million, which was in about 1940, there were no beavers. Um, I mean, at least not four-legged, flat-tailed things. You know, there were us. There were five million of us. Now there's 20 million of us. So what she argues is to try to restore as much as possible this pre-colonial wet, marshy condition, mimic the beavers, and create environments that really favor denitrification. And those environments are places where oxidized and reduced surfaces are close together. Okay, it's that simple. Um, so. People are working on this. This is a photo of one of them. Uh, some of these um, wet ponds, um, some sand-bottomed wet ponds, and different configurations of these, uh, you know, are pushing up around 30% removal. I've seen some documentation where they're up around 60% removal. Um, that's the kind of thing I think um, would be really useful and help us with this nutrient reduction. So, um, restoration. It, it's, it's tough in the face of high growth rates. The Bay clearly is over, uh, overly enriched. Um, I call it nutrient obesity. Um, it's, it's too much of a good thing. 
That's a better problem than having too much of a toxic thing. Um, it's still a problem. Uh, diffuse sources are incredibly important. Um, and I think we're going to need lots of creativity. Um, I'm not recommending that the state of Maryland have an oyster hatchery, a shad hatchery, and a beaver hatchery, but I think we ought to mimic some of the activities of beavers in the landscape. Make it wetter, moister, and have strong oxidized and reduced um, interfaces that are close together. And I think I've showed you a, an example of a very hot spot um, that's um, removing both nitrogen, and I didn't tell you the phosphorus story, but it removes a horrendous amount of phosphorus as well. Um, we need to make these hot spots more common and uh, learn how to use them. Done. Thank you.